It is a late summer morning somewhere south of the Duaba Lake. A thick layer of clouds made the surrounding wilderness gloomy and unpleasant. One of the Samogitian nobles, leaning on his spear, scratches his forehead staring at the deploying warriors of his tribe. Then, the first white banners with large black crosses emerge from behind the trees. The presence of armor-clad mounted knights is a sight to behold for the pagan warriors. The nobleman swirls his spear upon returning to the line. The clash that would decide the fate of the Eastern Baltic is about to begin. It's early summer of the year 1251. The inhospitable marshy woodlands of the Eastern Baltic remain one of the last bastions of paganism in medieval Europe. Throughout the last 50 years, the region bore witness to some intensive settlement and Christianization campaigns undertaken by the Catholic Church with the cooperation of Western monarchs. As you might imagine, it was a violent time for both the local tribes and crusading Westerners. Over the years, a number of skirmishes took many lives on both sides of the barricade, with the early apex of the conflict, which saw the decimation of the leading power of the Baltics, the Sword Brethren. Yet their crushing defeat in the Battle of Saule did not mean the Crusaders simply packed up and left. Instead, the remnants of the Sword Brothers were absorbed by the rising Teutonic Order and became its largely autonomous Livonian branch. Their casualties were quickly replaced as a constant stream of fresh recruits poured into the port of Riga thanks to the enduring popularity of the crusading movement. And, speaking bluntly, Baltic infidels were conveniently close in comparison to the remote ones living in the Holy Land. But just as the numbers of the reorganized Livonian order swelled, so too did the power and organization of the Baltic tribes grow. This was especially true for the Lithuanian tribes, whose statehood was probably the most refined of all the Baltic pagans. The majority of tribal warlords were busy fighting their neighbors, intertwined with occasional unions against a common enemy. But one ambitious Kunagas stood out from the rabble. His name was Mundaugas, by the time of our story, already an established Grand Duke of Lithuania, the first known in all history. The scant chronicles are very brief about any famous deeds of his early career, but by the 1250s, Mundaugas was undeniably the strongest pagan lord in the region. Probably not a conventional warrior of his people, Mundaugas cut swiftly through the intricacies of Lithuanian politics. To strengthen his authority, in the early 1250s, he was baptized and a couple years later was crowned as the very first king of Lithuania, hoping that his elevated prestige would reinforce his local affairs. Becoming the first Christian king in the Baltic opened many doors for Mundaugas, allowing him to lay expansion plans to the east and south. But more relevant to our story is the price he had to pay in exchange for the crown. Within the next six years of coronation, Mundaugas granted more and more lands to the Livonian order. The curious thing is that the Lithuanian king had only nominal control over much of these lands, which bore out suspicions over the validity of these seedings. In other words, there's a fair chance that the Livonian order fabricated at least some of these land treaties to justify their further expansion in the Baltics. But putting speculation aside, the formal acquisition of new territories allowed the order to connect its two branches. And soon, the Christian brothers enforced quite a ruthless plan to integrate new domains. The Livonian order moved to interfere with traditional customs of the land replace old inheritance laws, put its hands upon local trade, and constructed new fortifications to ensure the obedience of the people. Obviously, these strict measures were met with outrage among the tribesmen, especially among the warlike Samogitians, who soon rose in open hostility. The subsequent years were a turbulent time for the Livonian order, which struggled to bring Samogitia to Christian heel. Several raids and unexpected clashes ended with Samogitian victories, whose successes prompted the neighboring Zemigalians to rebel against their overlords as well. By the beginning of 1260, it was obvious that the pagan rebellion was not going to extinguish by itself. Eventually, the landmaster of the Livonian order resolved to tackle the insurgency with serious measures. He obtained a papal blessing for a crusade against the Samogitians, which helped to lure in more aspiring crusaders from the west. 
Within the next six months, a host of 8,000 men gathered near Memel Castle. Granted, a good chunk of this army was comprised of allied tribesmen of low combat value, but it was a significant number nonetheless. Landmaster Burkhardt had initially planned a punitive expedition into Samogitia, but upon receiving reports of a pagan host besieging the recently built stronghold of Georgenburg, he decided to strike there. The crusaders departed Memel Castle, slowly traversing through the uneasy terrain. The expedition was interrupted a few days later when the landmaster received fresh news of the large Samogitian army ravaging Courland some 10 days march to the north. Probably determined to inflict one critical blow to the tribesmen, Master Burkhardt ordered to turn north and face the enemy in the field. Two weeks later, on July 13th, the Christian scouts brought news that the Samogitian army was spotted deploying close to the southern shore of the Duerba Lake. Soon, the crusaders reached the battlefield to see a wide line of Baltic warriors readying for an upcoming encounter. The Samogitians were visibly less numerous, fielding around 4,000 men, and also modestly armed with only a fraction of the tribal nobility able to afford anything better than boiled leather. On the other side, the core of the Crusader army was formed by a couple hundred heavily armored mounted knights, supported by some ranks of well-equipped men-at-arms. The rest of the battle line was filled by the native levies recruited from the lands held by the Livonian order. Landmaster Burkhardt, himself a man of experience, had to wrestle for his authority over the ambitious mounted knights, who often hailed from important noble families. His lines were ready and, with no hesitation, Burkhardt gave the signal to attack. Hundreds of armor-clad riders rushed out to strike the enemy. A small brook crossing the damp terrain in the middle of the field slowed the knightly charge, but they still had enough momentum to hammer through the Samogitian line with fury, killing many pagans in an opening blow. The crusaders hoped that such a blow would easily rout the unruly tribesmen, but to their surprise, the Samogitian line yielded, but didn't break. More foot crusaders joined the fray, while in the center, mounted knights struggled in boggy terrain to retreat and make another charge. Most of them got embroiled in hand-to-hand -hand combat and the battlefield gradually evened out. Things didn't go as planned for the Livonian order, but they still had both enough advantages on their side and bigger numbers. Then, seeing the knightly charge going wrong, the Coronian warriors lost heart and began retreating. Some of them didn't even reach the enemy line. The Prussian tribesmen valiantly fought alongside the Christian knights, but most of the other pagan warriors soon followed the Coronians and abandoned their position in an uncontrolled rout. Seeing the enemy ranks plunging into disarray, the Samogitians rushed out of their position and swarmed the Crusaders. The battle turned into a bloodbath, as just a dozen or so were taken captive. With chaos mounting, only a fraction of the knights were able to escape and save their lives. Landmaster Burkhardt perished, and so did the majority of high-ranking officers of the Livonian Order. We don't know exactly the numbers of casualties, but chroniclers hint that three-quarters of the sworn brothers were slain by Samogitians, making the clash near Durba Lake the biggest defeat the military order had conceded against the indigenous Baltic people in the 13th century. The battle shifted the balance of power in the region and undid several decades of conquest conducted by the Livonian Order. With their manpower shattered, even more tribal rebellions broke out within the domains of both branches of the order, which slowed their expansion and took many long years to extinguish. The setback for the knights, however, was a gift for the Lithuanian tribes, which gradually rose in power, eventually becoming the largest pagan state of Eastern Europe.